You have your Bible tonight to the book of Luke in chapter number 24. And, you know, we usually come to this chapter and we look at it through human eyes. And we look at it through the eyes of the ladies that have come to the sepulcher that resurrection morning. And, and of course, there's Mary Magdalene and then there's Mary this and Mary that. Good luck keeping all the Marys straight in the Bible. If you can do that, you get a gold star. Keeping the Marys straight is about as hard as keeping the Herods straight. Good, good luck with that too. And, and anyway, the Marys have come. And there was, of course, was Joanna and, and others that had come that morning, Mary Magdalene. And, and then Peter and John are going to come. And, and, you know, we usually look at these events through the eyes of the humans that came. But if you ever stop to consider what it must have been like for those two angels... They have been dispatched from heaven and they have been sent to an incredibly forlorn place. They have absolutely no idea where they are going. All of a sudden, and most of the times in the Bible, I guess not every time, there's a few exceptions, but most of the times that angels come to the earth, they come in the form of men. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that these two angels have come as men and, and now they are inside that sepulcher and they are absolutely stunned. You know, can you imagine those two angels? They have never seen a place like this before. There are no sepulchers where they come from. Can you imagine as they come that resurrection morning and they're looking around and kind of hitting a wall and what is this place? And what is that big stone? And what in the world are these shelves in here for? And where in the world are we? I mean, these two angels have got to be looking at each other incredulous. There are no needs for sepulchers where they come from in heaven. And now they have been dispatched with a great message for that resurrection morning. I mean, stunned and amazed, they must be looking at each other. What in the world are we doing here? And yet as stunned as they were to be in such a place as a sepulcher, the biggest surprise is about to happen. So if you're able physically, would you stand together with me as we go to Luke chapter 24 and verse number 5. The ladies have come to the sepulcher and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they, the angels, said unto them, the ladies, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again and they remembered his words the angels are absolutely stunned why in the world are you here what are you looking for this morning father in heaven we pray for your help as we come to the great words of our god and i ask that you would do your business in our lives and would you please stir up the ground and and lord we are in desperate need of a revival of the word of god in our hearts, in our lives, in our homes. So I ask and pray that tonight you would do your work. If someone does not know they are saved according to the Bible, what a night to call upon the name of Christ and be born again. So we need your help now. We ask for it in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much. Please be seated. What in the world are you ladies doing here this morning? I mean, the angels are stunned that they are in a place that they don't even recognize. And to their absolute stunned amazement even further, somebody has actually come that morning to this sepulcher. And by the way, you know, that's what our Bible calls it every time, a sepulcher. I know we sing low in a grave he lay, but the Bible, at least our, not all the others do, but not our Bible. No, it doesn't call it a grave and it doesn't call it a tomb. Every time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, it is called a sepulcher. You know, I didn't even realize that until a few months ago, but sure enough, check it out. Every single time, it's a sepulcher. Now, there is one time that the place where Jesus was laid was called a tomb, but that is when it was called Joseph's tomb, Joseph of Arimathea. In other words, had Joseph and his family been laid inside that tomb, it would have been a tomb. But for the Lord Jesus Christ, our Bible goes out of its way to tell us that, no, Jesus was in a sepulcher. Well, that arrested my attention. I said, well, what exactly then is the, the meaning? What exactly is a sepulcher? And, and understand that in the New Testament, the word grave is used. And, and of course, the demons up by the northern shores of Galilee, they were in, in the graves. Graves and tombs are a common word. But no, when you study that word sepulcher, it's the most amazing thing. While a tomb and a grave is the abode of the dead, the word sepulcher comes from the word for memory or memorial. 
if Joseph and his family are going to be laid to rest in this place, it's going to be a tomb. The bones of the dead are going to lay there. But when it comes to my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, my Bible goes out of its way to say, no, sir, it's not a tomb. It is not a grave. It is a sepulcher. It is a memorial. Because after three days, all this thing is going to be is a great reminder that once for three days, Jesus was here, but he is no longer here. So if a human were to be put into that thing, it would have been a tomb. But as Jesus is laid there, it is a sepulcher. I know that's going to give us trouble when it comes to our songs. Lo, in the sepulcher he lay, Jesus our Savior. And up from the sepulcher he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. But check it out. That's exactly what the Bible says. They have come to the sepulcher that morning looking for Jesus. And to add injury to insult, these angels are looking at each other. What is this place? Why do humans need this place? And now suddenly these ladies have come that Sunday morning. And, you know, I, I, I recognize that we do have to give these ladies some credit. They certainly are courageous. Why, the Bible tells us they come at the crack of dawn, which meant they had to leave their homes in darkness. And, and to come to a cemetery in the night, well, that was a difficult thing. Back then, it was believed the demons rested at night in the graves, in the tombs, in the graveyards. So these ladies certainly are exhibiting great courage. And, for the record, after the sun set on Saturday night, these ladies had to rush to the market and they spent a lot of money because they ran out of spices and perfumes and, and certainly they are bringing a generous gift and certainly they are courageous and certainly they are there that morning but that doesn't stop the fact that the angels are really going to give it to them. And I know we like to soften this but there is no way around this. The angels are looking at these ladies and, and by the way all the money they spent the night before on spices and perfumes brother was that ever wasted money? And now the angels are incredulous. Why in the world have you come here today? Who exactly are you looking for today? Why seek ye the living among the dead? These are not soft words. These are not nice encouraging words. They're words of rebuke. Why, there is no reason in the world that you ought to come here this morning. Why have you ladies come to this place? I mean, there are a lot of other places where you could be, but the very last thing you ought to be doing this morning is looking for Jesus Christ in a place like this. It is absolutely absolutely impossible for Jesus to be here. Do you know why? Well, the Bible gives us the reason why. It says, re, he tells them, he's not here but is risen. Remember how he spake to you when he was yet in Galilee. You realize what they're saying? What in the world are you doing? What in the world have you come for? Who are you expecting to see? Don't you remember what he said unto you when he was yet in Galilee? Well, for the record tonight, this is what Jesus said when he was in Galilee. In Luke chapter 9, 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the scribes and chief priests and be slain and be raised the third day. I, for the record, when he was in Galilee, he said the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. For the record, when he was in Galilee, he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written in the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and be mocked, and shall be spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. So why have you come here today? I mean, he didn't say it once. He didn't say it twice. He really didn't say it three times because there is also the record while he was yet in Galilee that as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, the son of man's going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Good luck. If you can ever explain to me how you get three days and three nights from Friday night to Sunday, I'd really like to hear. But you understand, Jesus said it. It is not like this could happen. It's not like it might happen. It's not like there is a realm of possibility of this happening. There is absolutely no question. There is nothing else that could happen. Jesus Christ said, I will rise again. Jesus Christ said, three days and three nights. Jesus Christ said, he, the Father will raise me up. What part of I will 
will rise again. Don't you ladies seem to understand? What in the world are you doing here? What are those spices for? What are you spending your money on? Why have you come here this morning? Who are you expecting to see? Because when he was yet in Galilee, he told you again, then again, then again, then again. And by the way, if it's only recorded four times in our Bible, well, at the end of John, if everything Jesus said and did was written down, the world couldn't contain the volume. So how many times do you think he actually told them? No, no, we haven't recorded a series of times, but we don't have everything he said, and we don't have everything he preached, and we don't have everything he taught. How many times? Could it be dozens? Could it be hundreds of times that Jesus said, the third day I will rise again? What in the world are you doing here? Aren't his words enough? No, no, no. Aren't the words of Jesus enough? Because he said, make no mistake about it, I will rise again. So if he said that, why have you come here today? Aren't his words enough? Well, the ladies have certainly returned in Luke chapter 24. And in verse 11, they have come to the disciples who are gathered. The 12 now is whittled down to the 11. And, and the ladies have come back from the sepulcher. And they have told them that the angels were there. They told them what they heard. And in verse number 11, to the disciples now, to the 11 now, to the scholarly men that walk and talk with Jesus now, I to those chosen men that walked up and down the land preaching the gospel. The Bible says in verse 11, their words seem to them as idle tales. Idle tales, that's worse than what we imagine. Idle tales is a word in the New Testament that kind of meant babble or nonsense. When somebody's talking gibberish, they're talking idle tales. I, the disciples, it's not like, well, you may have made a mistake or, or it's not like, well, you, you must have dreamed something. The disciples are saying, you're crazy. You're crazy. Your words are idle tales. And then it says they believed him not. Well, excuse me, Sir Peter and Sir John and Sir Thomas and Sir Nathaniel and Sir Andrew and Sir rest of you. What in the world are you expecting this morning? What possibility could there be? What else could happen except the fact that the creator of the universe is going to keep his word? What else could happen? And yet when the ladies come back and tell the most obvious thing, the most normal thing, exactly what everybody should have been expecting, when the ladies come back with the report, he is not here, he is risen as he said. I mean, everybody should have just shrugged their shoulders and said, of course he is. Of course he is. Why, we live with him, talk with him. Our hands have handled him. Our ears listened to him. Our eyes saw him. We saw miracle after miracle after message after message, teaching after teaching. We've heard it all. We've seen it all. And by this time, is there any other outcome except that the words of Jesus Christ are going to come to pass? And their words seem like idle tales. Aren't his words enough? No. Aren't the words of Jesus enough? Well, Peter, and we know from the book of John, Peter and John have to see for themselves. So in verse number 12, then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves. What a thing to see. I mean, he stoops down, he goes, you know, got to stoop down to get inside that, that sepulcher. And when he goes in, the linen clothes are laid by themselves. Uh, they are just as they were when Jesus was wrapped in them. It, it is not like they're folded up neatly in the corner now, but the clothing, the linen clothes that were around the body of Jesus, uh, they're just still there. Do you know why? Because when Jesus rose from the dead, hey, he didn't need somebody to come like Lazarus needed and take the clothes off. Jesus went right through the clothes. And by the way, they didn't need the stone rolled away for Jesus to get out. The stone was rolled away for the ladies to get in. Jesus went right through the stone, or he may have gone right through the wall. 
But the Bible tells us again and again in the glorified body of Jesus. I mean, he vanishes and he comes through walls. No problem for him. So the clothes are still there. That's stunning in itself. I mean, Peter, why are you running here? Peter, what are you expecting to see? Peter, who are you looking for? Peter, what is your problem? I mean, you're the guy that went up on the mountain and saw the glory of God and Christ. You're the one that heard the Father say, this is my beloved son. You're the one that walked on the water and he caught you. You're the one that saw the miracles. You're the one who said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. What else do you possibly think could be the outcome this morning? What are you coming here to see? Who are you expecting? Come on, Peter and John. Aren't his words enough? Do we need something else beyond the words of Jesus? I mean, he said, I will rise again, I will rise again, I will rise again. Seems good enough. I mean, there's no wiggle room as Jonah was three days and three nights. The Son of Man will be three days, three nights in the belly of the earth. What part of I will rise again do you people seem to have a problem with, Mr. Disciple? What part of I will rise again don't you people understand? Why are you here, ladies? Why are you here, Mary Magdalene? Why are you here, Joanna? Why are you here, Mary, 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 and Mary? Why are you here, Peter? Why are you here, John? What in the world do you think you're going to see this morning? Obviously, there is one place where Jesus could not be that morning in that sepulcher. Aren't his words enough? Well, the Bible tells us that a fellow named Cleopas has left Jerusalem and he's traveling in Luke 24 to the village of Emmaus. What are you doing? Hey, 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 Cleopas, and please, Cleopas was a wonderful disciple. I mean, evidently, he was there at Calvary, and, and when most people forsook him and fled, it appears he didn't, and, and he is traveling to his home in Emmaus. Someone else is traveling with him, and that's one of those things that everybody will give you the guess, but the Bible doesn't say. Cleopas, what are you doing? Why in the world are you going to Emmaus today? You know, you're getting in the middle of the day now. What in the world are you doing? Why would you leave Jerusalem on this day of all days? If there ever was a day to be in Jerusalem, isn't this the day? This is the third day. Why are you going to Emmaus? What in the world do you think you're going to see? Why have you left Jerusalem? What are you thinking, Cleopas? And the Bible tells us in verse number 15, it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, well, that's always going to produce confusion. That's always going to produce the wrong answer. Human minds are trying to put it all together. And human minds are communing. They're probably seeing if something is on their heart, you know? I mean, human minds are reasoning in their minds. And that word actually means they're debating and arguing. I mean, humans are going to their heart to find the answers. Really? You, you know, you don't go to your heart to find the answers. You know why? Because our hearts are deceitful above all things. And if that weren't enough, they're desperately wicked. The biggest liar I know is living right down here. It'll lie to me all the time. And you have to be, well, you know, my heart tells me, well, that's good enough reason to run into your Bible and find something else out. Well, you know, I just feel this, Pastor Walker. You know, Pastor Snyder, my heart tells me so. My heart wouldn't lie to me. Oh, yes, it will. So here they are figuring it all out amongst themselves. They're communing and they're reasoning. And it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, in verse number 15, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. All right, now here they are going to Emmaus. Why are you going to Emmaus? And all of a sudden, Jesus is with them, and they don't know it's Jesus. So here they are, you know, and the conversation begins, and they start telling Jesus what happened in Jerusalem, really. Like you're going to tell Jesus what happened? And, and, and the Bible tells us, and go down, if you would, to verse 21. And beside all this, today is the third day. Really? Don't you think when they are actually quoting the words of Christ that something should have gone off inside? I mean, they're actually quoting Jesus. The third day I will rise again. The third day I will rise again. Three days, three nights I will rise again. Something should have gone off, don't you think? They are actually quoting the Lord Jesus Christ. So the logical question then, what are you doing here? 
Cleopas, why have you turned your back on Jerusalem? Why are you heading to the village of Emmaus? What is going on here? What is wrong with you people? I mean, he said, and you're actually quoting, this is the third day. How many times did you hear him say, on the third day he will rise again? What are you doing going to Emmaus? And so the Bible tells us, as they didn't believe what Jesus said, they didn't believe what Jesus spoke, the Word of God tells us that, that they preached to Jesus in verse 22, certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which went with us, to, uh, uh, with us went to the sepulcher and found that even as the women had said, but him they saw not. Really? What is your problem? Aren't his words enough? Because his words were not enough for all those Marys and Joanna and Mary Magdalene. And his words were not enough for Peter and John. And his words were not enough for Cleopas and whoever the other one was. And I know they weren't enough because if they were, they wouldn't be running to the sepulcher and they wouldn't go home to Emmaus. Aren't his words enough? What else does Jesus have to say? But three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. And so now the Lord Jesus, as the angels rebuke the women, he's going to rebuke these two. But I want you to know something very carefully. Jesus does not rebuke them for rejecting the eyewitness account of the women. He doesn't say, how come you didn't believe the ladies? He doesn't rebuke them for rejecting the account of Peter and John. And he doesn't rebuke them for rejecting the fact that the tomb or the sepulcher is empty. You know why Jesus rebuked them? Because they didn't believe the Bible. That's all they needed. Look at verse number 25. He said, that's Jesus, oh fools and slow of heart. I, I, I mean, you know, we like to soften that and we like to make that. There's nothing soft here. Oh fools and slow of heart. You know how we know they're fools and slow of heart? Because they're going home to Emmaus on the day that Jesus said he would rise again. Here they are going, what in the world do you think you're going to find there? Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not. You see the little word, ought not? It's a Bible way of saying in very strong language, what other outcome could there be? What else could possibly happen today? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning in Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Hey, Jesus didn't say, have a dream, have a vision. He didn't say, go have an interview with the ladies that were there. Hey, he didn't say, go have a pilgrimage. He didn't say, do this, that, and the other thing. You know what Jesus did? He just started giving them the Bible. The Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, and then more Bible. And I mean, you talk about a message. He started in Genesis and went to Malachi. I got to tell you, that one is a, go uh, that is a golden message for the ages. And everywhere he did. He stopped and said, there he is. There's the Messiah. What else do you think was going to happen today? So now there's more to the list. Cleopas and whoever the other one was, aren't his words enough? No, isn't the Bible enough? Aren't the scriptures enough? Couldn't you have gone to the Psalms and read that he would not suffer his holy one to see corruption? What in the world are you doing here? Why have you come to this place? What are you looking for? Why are you going home to Emmaus? Why are you running to the sepulcher? What in the world do you think could have happened today aside from one thing? And that's that the creator of the universe who is the way, the truth, and the life would simply rise just exactly what he said. Aren't his words enough? And so in verse number 30, it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread, blessed it, break it, gave it to them. Their eyes were open, they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. What a moment in time. So now the Lord Jesus, rather unusual that the guests would break the bread, but he did. And after he breaks the bread, all of a sudden, he vanished out of their sight, and they knew it was him. And yet when you come to verse number 32, uh, why these men, uh, Cleopas, or could have been his wife, a woman, but whoever it was, Cleopas and the other, they really have an encounter, don't they? They really have an experience. I mean, they really had something special in their life. But you know, the thing that changed their life was not the fact that Jesus Christ was sitting with them, nor was it the fact that Jesus broke the bread 
nor was it the fact that Jesus vanished out of their sight. Do you know what changed them? Look at verse 32. They said one to the other, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the Scriptures? Aren't his words enough? Because we're making our way through Luke 24 and, and angels at an empty sepulcher don't seem to be enough. And ladies coming back with a report, he's not here. That doesn't seem to be enough. And Peter and John going and looking inside, that doesn't seem to be enough. And now Cleopas is going to do a U-turn, and these two are going to go all the way back to Jerusalem, which they never should have left in the first place, and they're going to say, you know, we just met Jesus, and that's not going to be enough. And Mary Magdalene's going to tell her story, and that's not going to be enough. Excuse me, the Bible says two or three witnesses, and we are well past a dozen now. Aren't his words enough? Don't you know what's happened in Muslim countries? These people are having dreams and they're getting saved. Except the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not by dreams, not by visions, hearing by the word of God. Yeah, but they're having all these dreams. But the Bible says faith cometh by hearing when we give a hearing to the word of God. Yeah, but don't you understand the experiences and the encounters and people are piling into arenas and stadiums and oh, yeah, these great movings are happening around there. Yeah, yeah, but the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So down through the course of time, there has always been people who say we need visions and we need dreams and we need experiences and we need encounters and we need shows and we need this, that, and the other thing. And if we see this, we're going to believe. Oh, really? Like if somebody comes back from the dead named Lazarus and he knocks on the door of your five brothers, oh, yeah, then you're going to believe? And that's when Abraham said, if they believe not Moses and the prophets, they're not going to believe somebody who comes back from the dead. It is not resurrections. It is not visions. It is not dreams. It is not signs. It is not wonders. It is the Bible. There is one reason and only one reason why every single one of these men and ladies should have been on their faces that morning saying, glory to God, this is the day we've been waiting for. Because he said he would rise again. Because the word of Christ said he would rise again. Isn't the Bible enough? Oh, we have to have something else, something new, something cool, something modern, something nobody else has. Isn't the Bible going to be enough? Because the Bible was not enough for Mary Magdalene, Joanna, all the other Marys. The Bible was not enough for Peter. The Bible was not enough for John. Uh, and not in Luke, but, you know, the Bible certainly was not enough for Thomas. And the Bible wasn't enough for Cleopas and whoever the other disciple was. Because if it was, they wouldn't have been on that road. Isn't the Bible enough? Or do we have to have something else and something new? So now Cleopas comes back, the two come back, and, and in verse number 36, as they thus spoke, how about this? Jesus himself. No, 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 this isn't Mary Magdalene, this isn't Mary, 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 Joanna. Oh, no, no, this isn't Peter and John, and this isn't Mary, Ma nope, this isn't Cleopas now. Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Well, they're going to believe now. Oh, i take care of that. I mean, after all, right in front of my eyeballs, there's Jesus. Jesus himself stands right in the midst of them. Of course, they're going to believe now, obviously, right? So I'd take care of the problem until you get to verse 37. They were terrified. Why? They were affrighted. They're having a panic attack. Why? What are you afraid of? And suppose that they had seen a spirit. Really? I mean, what else do you think could happen today? What, what, what are you expecting? How many times did you hear him say? Could have been hundreds of times. I will rise again. I will rise again. I will rise again. And then he did what he exactly said what he would do, which shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. And, and now, well, I'm not going to believe Mary, and I'm not going to believe, you know, Joanna, her husband, works for Herod. She's probably got ulterior motives. And, and, you know, Cleopas is a good guy, but, you know, who knows? And the other guy we don't know about. And, and then, you know, Joe, I mean, all these people, you got to be kidding me. And, and one by one by one, I'm not going to believe that. I'm not going to believe that. I'm not going to believe that. And so Jesus himself is standing right there, and they still don't believe. 
This is the problem with the signs and wonders crowd, with the they're having dreams in Iraq crowd. This is the problem with the experience and the encounters. You know what it is? It says in 1 Corinthians 1 is perfect. The Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But no, no, we're not looking for signs and we're not looking for human wisdom. We preach Christ crucified. And you know the reason? It's right here in this chapter. Because if somebody needs an experience, a dream, a sign, a vision, some human encounter to believe, they will never, ever believe. Do you know all they're going to do? They're just going to move the goalposts. That's exactly what they do. Uh, what if the night before, right? The night before. What if you were to say, you know, tomorrow, the ladies are going to go to the sepulcher and they're going to meet two angels who say he is not here. Are you going to believe Jesus rose from the dead? Oh, yeah. If that had happened, you better believe we're going to believe. And then what if Peter and John, and then what about Mary Magdalene? What if she meets somebody she thinks is the gardener, it's really Jesus? Are you going to believe them? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. No doubt about it. And what about Cleopas? You know, he's a good guy. And if he comes back and says that Jesus broke bread, are you going to believe Cleopas? And, you know, the night before, they would all said, we'll believe that, we'll believe that, we'll believe that, we'll believe that, and they don't, because for these people, the Bible was not enough. So now it's not going to matter what happens. They're just going to keep moving the goalposts. And Jesus himself is right in front of them. They think they're looking at a ghost. And in verse 39, because this is going to get it done, behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see. That's going to do it. Jesus said, all right, come on, Thomas. Stick your hand right in my side. Come on, here's my nail print. Are you going to believe now? And that wasn't enough. So in verse number 41, have ye any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. Now, it's not the biggest thing in the world, but just as an aside, our Bible's the only one that says they gave him a honeycomb. Now, I don't know about you, but I like a Bible where you get to have dessert. You know what I'm saying? So that works for me. So Jesus has the broiled fish. Then he has the honeycomb, and he took it, and look at this right in front of him. He did eat before them. You know, ghosts don't eat before you, and ghosts don't say, handle me and see. Aren't you going to believe now for all you're worried about and all your Jesus himself has stood in front of them? And you would think these disciples would finally get it. You would think they would finally say, but when human experience is the authority, they're never going to be satisfied. Because we don't come by sight, we walk by faith. And when we need signs and wonders in order to believe and dreams and visions and encounters and experiences, there will never be a good enough experience. There will never be a fabulous enough sign. There will never be enough wonders. No one who is looking for human experiences will ever get saved. Because faith comes when you give a hearing to the Word of God. So what is Jesus going to do, right? I mean, yeah, a lot of things he could have done, right? He could, I mean, <laughs> I got to tell you, if he had brought thunder and brimstone and fire down from like he did on Sodom and Gomorrah, if he had said, I had it with you guys, I mean, three and a half years, and this is what I have to work with, and the Lord wiped them right out, I got to tell you, I think I, part of me would understand why. And if he did, of course, then, you know, he'd probably deal with us the same way, so it's good he didn't. But you talk about patience. Look at verse 44. Jesus is going to fix the problem. And he's not going to give them a sign. He's not going to give them a wonder. And he's not going to give them an incredible experience. Instead, he said, these are the words which I spake unto you when I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms. That's unusual. Usually it's just Moses and the prophets. Hey, the Psalms and Proverbs and the wisdom literature is as much Bible as the Ten Commandments is. Then, look at verse 45, opened he their understanding, not that they might see the empty sepulcher, not that they might believe the words of the women, not that they might listen to Cleopas, but they might understand the scriptures. And so look at what he said next. Thus it is written. You know how he fixed the problem? 
And the problem did get fixed because the next thing you know, these disciples are, are going into all the world preaching the gospel to every creature. You know how you fix the problem? Not with signs and wonders. You don't go to the arena, pile in there in downtown Denver and let some famous faith healer put on a show. And it's not about dreams and visions. No, sir. If they believe not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Jesus fixed the problem by giving them the Bible, the Bible, and then more Bible. From Moses in Genesis 1-1 to the Psalms to the last prophet Malachi, Bible, Bible, Bible. Because if we're not going to believe the Bible, it doesn't matter what happens. Aren't his words enough? Are they enough for you tonight? Are they enough for me tonight? Do we need some new show, some new program? But this latest blogger says, but this famous writer at Amazon says this, but this guy on TV says this, but this lady on the radio says this. Isn't the Bible enough? Do we need something else other than waking up on a Monday morning and grabbing our Bible and, and just you and the Lord? And the, Is there anything else we need aside from the Word of God? We wonder why we're such, as Jesus said, a faithless and perverse generation. Well, you're looking at it right here in Luke 24. The Bible wasn't enough. It would be awfully discouraging if that were the end of the story. And, you know, you can almost imagine how must Jesus feel. You know, Peter and John and James, and what's your problem? And Cleopas, how many messages did you hear? And ladies, what are you doing? What are you going to the, and, and Mary Magdalene, what are you doing? I saved you, and what, what in the world are you doing? What do you think you're going to find down there in that sepulcher? And, and, you know, it would be awfully discouraging because we come to the end of Luke 24, and, and you and I would have to say, well, nobody got it. I mean, the Bible was not enough for the women. The Bible wasn't enough for Peter. The Bible's not enough for John. The Bible's not enough for the disciples. The Bible's not enough for Cleopas. The Bible's not enough for Thomas. The Bible's not enough for Cleopas's friend. I mean, you and I are just going to have to shrug our shoulders and say, that's really discouraging because it would appear in Luke 24 that there wasn't anyone. But there was. No, no, the Bible was not enough for the disciples. It wasn't enough for those ladies. The Bible wasn't enough. But there was one person, and I think only one, for whom the Bible was enough. Just one. You read the story in John chapter number 12. It is a few days before Jesus is going to go to the cross, before the triumphal entry, and, and he is in the house of a fellow named Simon. He's called in Matthew Simon the leper, and I think we could also call him Simon the former leper. No doubt Jesus had done his work in Simon's life. And out of gratitude, Simon has Jesus into his house. And, and of course, as Jesus comes, good old Martha, you know, she gets hammered a lot and maybe with good reason. But, you know, there's something special about somebody that's working. I, I know that the feet of Jesus is a lot better than being in the kitchen. But, you know, somebody's got to do the work in the kitchen, too. And, and Martha's doing that. And, of course, there's Mary where Mary is at the feet of Jesus. And then she takes a pound of ointment of spikenard a perfume that comes from the Himalayan mountains, that if you run the numbers, to us it would be worth $50,000. And she comes to Jesus, breaks the neck of that perfume, and anoints the head and the body of Jesus, and then in one of the greatest acts of humility, Mary of Bethany gets down on her hands and knees, and with her hair she dries the feet of Jesus. What a thing. And here comes Judas, the dirty, rotten, scoundrel, thief, crook, Judas. Hey, he must have sounded so sanctimonious, you think? <clears throat> Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Really? But you know, it wasn't just Judas. He may have been the guy that was the leader, but in Matthew it says the rest of the disciples started chiming in too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, what a waste this is. What a waste. And then the Lord Jesus said, let her alone. And then he added these words, against the day of my burying, has she kept this? You know, for all the Marys that were running to the sepulcher that resurrection morning, there was one Mary who wasn't there. 
and that was Mary of Bethany. Because a week earlier, give or take a bit, Mary had taken her gift, far more expensive than anybody else, and she anointed the body of Jesus for his burial. Do you know what she was saying? She was saying, Jesus, I am anointing you right now because if I wait three days and three nights, and that was the custom, you'd anoint somebody after three days so the body wouldn't decompose, at least not for a while. And she says, you know, I'm doing this now. Jesus said she is doing this against the day of my burial. She is doing this because if she waits three days after Calvary, there won't be a body in that sepulcher to anoint. In other words, is the Bible enough? Not for Peter, not for John, not for Mary Magdalene, not for Joanna, not for him, not for her. But for Mary of Bethany, yep. He said he would rise again. So I am bringing this offering to anoint him now. Because if I wait three days after the cross, he won't be there. Somebody did believe. There is one person for whom the words of Jesus was enough. See, in a church like First Baptist Church, you've heard it again and again and again, and you should. Your pastor, both of them, have stood up multiple times and said, the Bible is the inspired word of God. Glory to God, it is. And the Bible is the preserved word of God. Thank the Lord. And the Bible is the complete word of God. Thank him for that. But is the Bible enough? Is it enough? Or are we going to need visions and dreams and experiences? And Is it enough? Because when it was all said and done, for the 20,000 people that took the free meal, for the disciples that wandered the countryside for three plus years, when it was all said and done, you could only find one person who said the Bible is enough. I know we believe the right things about the Bible. That's good. But from Luke chapter 24, there's another question. Is the Bible enough? 